Hi, everybody. I hope everything is going super well. Um, uh, we are super excited to have um, Papathia Jenkins with us today. I have a little, um, a little introduction for her, um, if you will bear with me for a second. And then she has a lot to say about her career and all of her accomplishments. And, and, and then at the end, um, she might sing something for us. And she will also be um, opening up for questions at the end. So be thinking about anything that comes up. You can type it in the chat box and I will facilitate that at the end, okay? Um, so here we go. We, uh, we're very, very, I'm so pleased to have um, Kapathia Jenkins with us today for our very first Wednesday webinar at Wharton. Kapathia is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and she has made a, had a stunning career on and off Broadway. Some of her credits include the Broadway Disney production of Newsies, um, and she also created the role of Harriet Jackson in the Broadway production of The Civil War. She starred in the 2000 off-Broadway production <laughs> of Godspell and won critical acclaim in The Look of Love. Ms. Jenkins was nominated for a Drama Desk Award for her starring role in the 2007 off-Broadway production of Misunderstanding Manny, the Hattie McDaniel story. Um, she has also concertized regularly with orchestras around the world from the Cleveland Orchestra to the Calgary and Hong Kong Philharmonics. And she's also appeared in Moscow and St. Petersburg with big bands. Ms. Jenkins has performed in Broadway Ambassador, eh, I'm sorry, Broadway Ambassadors to Cuba concert, and was also a guest soloist with the Philly Pops, the Cincinnati Pops, and the New York Pops at Carnegie Hall. Her television credits include The Wiz Live on NBC, 30 Rock, The Practice, Law and Order SVU, The Sopranos, and Law and Order. She can be seen in the film Musical Chairs and be heard on the film soundtracks of Nine, Chicago, and Legally Blonde 2. Welcome, Kapathia. We are so honored to have you with us today, and I can't wait to hear about your experiences in the professional performance world. And with that, I would love to hand it over to you. Thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am so thrilled to be here. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you about myself. It's so funny when I listen to um, uh, an introduction of myself, I'm thinking, it sounds so fancy, but it's me. <laughs> I love that. Uh, okay. So uh, as she said, I'm born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I've been singing as far back as I can remember, like three years old, you know, with a hairbrush in the mirror, <laughs> making up songs and all that. But when I was in the third grade, my uh, music teacher said to my mom, I think this girl has some real talent and you should nurture it. And my mom did. So I began to learn how to sing. And all of my early training, I was learning how to sing classically. Um, but also, at the same time, growing up in the church singing gospel music every Sunday. Um, so through high school, I learned Italian, French, German arias. That's the basics of my training, sort of the, the mechanics of it. Um, and after high school, um, my teachers wanted me to go to Juilliard, but I knew by then, because I had been studying classically, but also singing gospel music, I knew that I didn't want a career in classical music. I knew that much. Um, so I did not want to go to Juilliard. I chose Temple University for a jazz vocal performance uh, major. And at Temple, I learned so much. Temple gave me um, the opportunity sort of to broaden my horizons, broaden the way I think about music. Um, I was in a jazz program and all of my professors were still gigging on the weekends. So I could go see them at clubs. 
Um, I listen to a lot of horn players and the way they improvise within, within a chord structure. All of that opened my ears uh, in a way that I don't think I would have um, been able to do uh, unless being in a jazz kind of saturated jazz program. Um, the other thing I learned at Temple University is I had a voice teacher that taught me how to sing through my passaggio. And that is the space between the head and chest voice. How to navigate that to get the same sound and the same quality all the way up, all the way down. I learned that in college and that really has been the basis for my entire career. Um, and so I'm grateful that I learned that <laughs> so early on. Um, when I left Temple, I auditioned for a producer who had shows, uh, like review shows and, and things like that in resort towns. So my first professional gig was a review show singing like the music of Motown, and R&B, old soul um, in Bermuda, in Bermuda, in a resort in Bermuda. And I was there for nine months. And I stayed with that producer for a few years. He had shows in Bermuda, in Atlantic City, in Lake Tahoe, um, in Miami, South Beach. And so I did those, those kind of shows for a few years. And then, I thought, I think I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back home to New York and just see if I have what it takes to do musical theater. Um, I auditioned and my first musical theater tour was Dream Girls. I got to play Effie um, in a national tour of Dream Girls. And from there, I really was bit by the bug of the acting and the singing going hand in hand. It was something that I really loved about that. Um, so I did Dream Girls, I did Ain't Misbehaving, I did um, national tours, I did a lot of regional theater, a lot of summer stock. Um, and I did a European tour of Bubbling Brown Sugar. I was in Europe for a year, um, traveling all around. That was a great education. Um, and then once again, I thought, I want to go back home and see now if I have what it takes to be on Broadway. Ah! <laughs> um, and you know, the thing, the thing about it is you get these little, uh, whispers in your ear or in your spirit about where you want to where you want to go next what what you want to do so that little whisper came and it was time for me to audition for Broadway and this is one of two stories that I want to share with you where I had pivotal moments in my career that shaped me um, and there's still lessons that I live by today. They shaped me throughout my career. So my audition for the Civil War, the Civil War was my Broadway debut. Uh, Frank Wildhorn wrote the music. Jerry Zachs was the director. And I am at my final callback. And for the callback, they gave us music from the show to learn. Um, and so I'm sitting in the waiting room and every girl that goes in before me, I can hear through the door, every girl is belting out the song. And I'm thinking I had planned to do it small. I would planned to really dig into the lyric and the melody and just let it be this kind of haunting thing. It, was, it didn't feel like it wanted to be belted. And so I'm sitting there, I'm already nervous. And now I'm more nervous because I'm thinking, should I be belting it? And is that what they want me to do? Oh my God, I didn't plan it. Okay, so I'm nervous <laughs> and it's my turn. I get into the room and Frank Wildhorn is there and Jerry Zaxx and all the producers, it's like a long table 
of people and then there's the accompanist and I stand there nervous, shaking. And I look to the accompanist, you know, and give the nod, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and, um, and in that split second, I think to myself, trust your instincts, just go for it. So I sing it the way I planned and I finish, and I'll never forget this, Frank Wildhorn says, that was delicious. And from that moment on, I learned to trust my instincts. No matter what's going on around me, the noise, you know, other people, what other people are doing, always trust my instincts. And it doesn't mean that my instincts are always what the director or the musical director is looking for, but what it does for me is it grounds me. It, my two feet center in the center of who I am and I go for it. And if the director says, we wanna try it a different way, I'm always open to that and ready to play in the room and all that. But the trusting my instincts has served me well in my career. Um, it's something that I still live by today. Um, even when I'm deciding on a project, if I want to do it, if I don't want to do it, I listen to that still small voice inside of me um, because there will always be noise. There'll always be noise, but you have to trust yourself. So that's, that's the first lesson, pivotal lesson that I learned. The second comes on my second Broadway show, The Look of Love. And that was a roundabout theater production. And it was what we would call a jukebox musical, um, celebrating the music of Burt Bacharach and Hal David. An extraordinary catalog of music. Um, so much popular song that people know and love. And I had a lot of those songs. Um, uh, for my track in the show. One of those songs was the actual title, The Look of Love. Um, and that song opened the show with a small pen light on my face, everything else dark. And I start to sing The Look of Love really small. And as the light grows and gets bigger and bigger, the song gets bigger and bigger. And then by the end, the entire company is on the stage. It's a full production opening number. So, you know, to say the least, it was a lot of pressure. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, so at this time, in my career, I had already done the Civil War, which didn't run for a long time, by the way. Uh, but um, I had already started to get some notoriety in New York City, um, and people started to know my name, and the things that they would say around my name is, oh gosh, her voice is so beautiful. The tone is pristine and crystal clear and so beautiful. Okay, so what I had started to do, whether consciously or unconsciously, I had began to begun to uh, internalize those things, right? Internalizing all of that, which made me believe that every time I opened my mouth, it had to be perfect. It had to be beautiful. It had to be this pristine tone and sound. So when you're doing Broadway and eight shows a week, what you quickly learn is that you cannot sustain that. It is, it is not sustainable to try to be a perfectionist and do eight shows a week or to try to do this work at all. And so to give you a, an idea of, of a day, from the moment I would wake up in the morning, let's say around 10, the first thing I would do is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, is check my voice. That was the first thing. And from that moment throughout the day, I was nervous all day. And nervous like, like the nervous you get just before you're gonna go on stage. That is not sustainable. 
But in my head, I was thinking, well, what if I forget my words? Well, what if I crack? Well, what if I yodel? Well, what if I fall? Well, what? Just all of this, this like nervous anxiety all, all, all day. So there's one night during the show, uh, we started the show, we did the opening number, all that. And then it's time for me to do another song. And the way I get on stage is I go under the deck, get on an elevator that rides me up to the stage. And as I'm being revealed, I begin to sing the song. And, and on this particular night, I'm coming up. And then, mind you, I've been nervous all day. <laughs> nervous all day. So I'm coming up, I'm coming up. I give, I start the song just as I'm revealed. And as I start the song, I think to myself, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. My mouth is dry. I'm not going to make it. So now I'm panicking. My mouth is dry. I can't get any spin in my tone. I, I just can't. So now, but I'm not, I don't stop. I, can't, I keep going. But now it's like I'm talk singing or like rapping or whatever, just to kind of get through it. Oh my God, the nerves. And so I, I finish the song, I get off stage and the stage manager and everybody's like, are you okay? What happened? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I run for my quick change. I, you know, change into my next thing. I come out on stage. I open my mouth to sing and it's fine. I'm fine, I'm okay, I'm just singing, and I'm fine. So what that teaches me is this thing up here is, can make or break you. It has so much power over this moment, right? So what I've learned is that in that moment, moment I learned, well, I felt like I crashed and burned out there, but I didn't die. Nobody got hurt. It's okay. I'm okay. It's all going to be okay. And that set me on the path of knowing that I will not try to be a perfectionist, but I will operate in a space of excellence so that when I show up to do my work, I am fully prepared. I've learned all my music. I've learned my harmonies. I know my words. And now I'm doing a lot of concert work. I know my patter or a, a, a gist of an idea of a patter that I want to do with the audience. I know all of that stuff so that when I am there, I can be in the moment. When you are trying to be a perfectionist, you are never in the moment. You are always in your head because you're either thinking about the past, oh, I didn't sing that note good, or I could have did that note better, or you're thinking about the future. Okay, so when I get to, um, how am I gonna get to that high note? I'm gonna do it like this, I'm gonna do it. Never, you can never be present in this moment which is where all the fun is, which is where all the joy is for me. And so those two things, thank God they happened early in my career because they have shaped who I had become. Um, and I have created roles in original Broadway companies for five shows. Um, I'm really, really proud of that. The last show I did closed, I think it was 2014, which was Disney's Newsies. And since then I have been, you know, singing with symphony orchestras around the world and having the time of my life. It is so fun to, <laughs> to stand on a stage, you know, with 60 or 80 piece orchestras, start your intro. And I'm this, I'm back to being that little girl from Brooklyn again, going, oh my God. I get to do this. I get to do this for a living. So I am the happiest when I am on stage and in pure joy, pure joy, um, because I'm trusting my instincts and, um, and I'm in the moment. 
So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And right now, before I take your questions, I want to sing a, a little song for you. And I will tell you in full disclosure, with everything that's going on in the world, with the pandemic and I'm quarantined and, oh, and all of that. And then with the civil unrest uh, in our country and, and feeling the sadness and the, the frustration of you know unarmed black people being killed and just the frustration, the rage and the, um, and the anger around that, it has been difficult for me to find a song in my spirit uh, because my natural state is to be in the light. I'm always fighting to get back to the light and I use music to do that. <laughs> uh, and it's been challenging to find, a, uh, to find music in my spirit, but this song is hopeful and I am hopeful about our future, and, uh, um, and that's what, what helps me. So here we go. I see trees of green, red roses too. I watch the bloom for me and for you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, the bright blessed day and dark sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, are also on the faces of people passing by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies crying. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I think to myself, what a wonderful world, oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that was beautiful oh, thank you. and and all you had to say was so inspiring i love um oh, I, I love all the stuff about staying in the moment i think that is so true yeah, and true. such an important oh, lesson that mm -hmm. anyone who wants to perform has to learn whether they're an instrumentalist I'm, or a singer because you can't you can't think about what you used to you were doing a minute ago because you got to stay present Absolutely. That's yeah. amazing, amazing That's advice. Awesome. Love it. Um, I would love it if some people could write in some questions uh, into the Q&A um, and Kapathia would be happy to answer them for you. Um, I have a couple to get us started. So while okay. I'm waiting for people, um, so 
one of the things, and you kind of touched on this a little bit in your talk, um, one of the things that you you had said was that like, you know, being such a perfectionist is kind of unsustainable, right? Whenever, whenever you're doing so many shows per week. Um, so I'm kind of wondering like, how do you handle that kind of not just mental but physical stress on your body of like always having to be on stage and like recovery time and things like that what do you do for self-care hmm. well i'll tell you you know singers particularly ask me this all the time and i think they they think it's a magic thing but it's not <laughs> it really for me it is at least eight hours of sleep and i drink a lot of water Mm -hmm. I drink water all day uh, with every meal and just all day. That is really uh, the two most important things. And sometimes, you know, you may be feeling under the weather or, you know, particularly with travel. Um, sometimes I have to get off the plane and hit the ground running, you know, like go straight to the theater for rehearsal or whatever. Um, so water is like the nectar of the gods when you, when you, particularly when you can't get the eight hours of sleep that you need. Some people can function on six or seven, but eight is my sweet spot. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really that. And then after a show, um, you know, for me, I like to wind down and I like to be quiet. And sometimes you're not able to do that because there is, you know, a gala dinner afterwards or, you know, there are going to be donors at the dinner or, or whatever. And those, I just sort of build that in to my show, right? Because singing is one kind of stress, but talking um, particularly in a loud room of dinner and guests and everyone's excited, that is really, really taxing. Um, but I build it in. And when, you, when you've been in this business as long as I, I have, you realize that those things are just as important as doing the show. When you get to meet people who, you know, who have given money to an organization or given money to a, an orchestra or a theater or a producer or whatever, that is so important. They are our angels. They are the reason why we get to do what we do. And so it's part of it. I don't complain about it. I sit, I talk, I have a great time and I love to talk. <laughs> So I have a great time with them. And then I go back to my hotel room or, where, or go back home or whatever. And I, I wind down, I'm quiet and I sleep. I sleep as deep as I can. Um, sometimes I may take a steam with just water in the steamer. Um, and just to bring everything sort of back down to one. Um, and then in the mornings, I wake up very slow. It's like my eyes are open, but I'm walking around, but I don't know if anybody is home yet. You know what I mean? It's really, really slow. Um, and then, and also the thing that I do without fail is I do a vocal warm up before I, before anything. I do a vocal warm up. I hum, and my warm up consists of starting to hum. My hum goes to an oo, then an e, then an ah. By the time I get to ah, I'm singing and I'm open and I can feel what I need to feel. So that's a long answer, but, but that's what I do to sort of keep my body and my voice and everything ready to go. No, that's excellent. Very good advice. I mean, yeah, you have to take care of yourself, right? Absolutely. Um, okay, so Michelle asks, uh, what is your fav what was your favorite part that you've ever played? Hi, Michelle. Thank you for that question. Oh gosh, you know, this is a hard one because I like all of what I've done for different reasons, right? So I talked about my Broadway debut. Uh, you know, I was playing a, a White House maid to, um, to Abraham Lincoln. 
and I got to sing a solo on the St. James Theater stage. And if you haven't been in that theater, you know, when you stand on stage, the seats go all the way up. Oh my God, I can see it right now. Um, and so that you never get a, another chance to have your first time. You know what I mean? And so that was so special. <laughs> it was just so special. Um, but I, you know, I have feelings around all of the things that I've done, but I'll tell you about that one. And then also um, the being in Newsies. Newsies was my fifth show. And I, you know, had, I was one of the older people in the company and I got to work with all these young people who were making their debuts like I did in the Civil War. And so just, it just reminded me of, of my debut. And so that was a really special one too. Um, but if you let me talk and talk and talk, I can tell you something special about all of them. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Uh, great. So Mariah, who's one of our instructors at PAS, actually, uh, that's the Performing Arts School, says that, hi, Kapathia, uh, one of the Wharton instructors here. Can you tell us what routine you have physically or mentally to prep yourself before a performance? Hi, Mariah. Um, and thank you for all you do. Um, so one of the things I picked up in the last maybe seven years now is I meditate. I meditate and it's part of my morning practice. So I, I journal, I meditate, I read something positive, um, and I work out, I move my body every day. Um, and that's all in preparation for any day. Uh, and then for performance later on in that day, let's say, I do a vocal warm up, as I said, um, and depending on what time the show is, if it's like an eight o'clock show, whatever, I'm usually in my dressing room at least an hour before. I've already warmed up in the hotel room. I've at least started to hum and get things moving. Um, and so I may um, get on the floor and just stretch a little bit just to get the blood moving. Um, and while I'm putting on my makeup, I'm just in quiet. I really, really like quiet. Um, even if I'm sharing a dressing room with someone. Um, and I know some of my friends like to listen to music or whatever. I just like quiet. I like that time with myself. Um, and then, you know, I put my, do my makeup, get my, my, costume or my gown on or whatever. And then in the wings, I'm again, I'm quiet. And just before I go like step on the stage, that's probably when I'm the most nervous. Um, and I could like run, run from the building with nerves. <laughs> But that's the moment where I'm just, I'm quiet. And if, if my nerves are crazy, because nerves always come for me, they always come. I think when I stop getting nervous, it'll be time for me to hang it up. But sometimes when it's crazy, like if I'm at, you know, Carnegie Hall or the Kennedy Center or, you know, these like iconic places, sometimes my nerves can, I can be out of myself and I'll just ground myself and tell myself, you've done your homework. You've done this over and over. You know it. You know it. Take a breath. Plant your feet. You know this. You know this. And, and deep breathing. And that will usually bring me back to this moment. And then I'll step on stage. And from the moment I say my first thing or hit my first note, it releases and I'm OK. And I feel like I'm in my living room and we're just playing. So yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> Great. All right. Um, someone asks, can you repeat again? What was the moment that you decided not to be a perfectionist? What was the catalyst of that moment? If you wouldn't mind repeating that. Yes. The catalyst of that moment was realizing that, you know, I had been in my head, I had subconsciously 
or, or consciously started to internalize all of the positive feedback or all of the positive reviews that I was getting for the sound of my voice. And internalizing that, that my voice is beautiful, that the tone is so perfect, that it's pristine, it's crystal clear. Um, and then feeling like every time I opened my mouth, I had to be that or it wasn't good. And that's not true. It's not true. So the catalyst of that was actually being on a Broadway stage and feeling because I'm letting all of this in my head, you know, what if you mess up? What if you, what if you, what if you, what if you, and in the moment, not being able to sing the way I would normally sing, letting the nerves control the moment. Um, after that happened, I realized that I have to, once I prepare and do my homework and, and do it at the highest level, my work ethic is high. It's really, really high. It's a strong work ethic. I will learn my music. I will learn my words. And to give you an idea before a concert, let's say with a symphony, a week to 10 days out from that date, every day I am in my office, which is where I'm at now. I'm in my office and I sing through my program. I warm up first and sing through my program as if I'm doing it with the, with the orchestra every day every day until it is just, I, I, it just, it just comes because when the nerves come, I'm going to still be able to do it. And I'm not going to have to worry about what if I mess up? What if I crack? What if I croak? Wh whatever. And so that work ethic became my space of excellence. That is where it all happens. Perfectionism is something that I cannot sustain because I, when you're particularly when you're traveling around the world, you're getting off a plane, when you're doing eight shows a week, there is no way you're going to always be perfect. But I can guarantee you that I will always be excellent. So I hope that answers your question. Great. Um, actually, I'm going to skip around a little bit just because we had a new question come in that is very related to what you were just talking about. So someone says, so for those of us who maybe get nervous, we're very nervous when we perform, um, preparation must be like 100% or more than 100% of the equation, right? That is absolutely correct. It's absolutely correct. I will tell you, you know, when I was, I spoke about my time when, when I was a kid, right? And I was singing with, with choruses and choirs. And, and I remember in high school, um, before a, a performance, I was so nervous, I would break out in hives. I would break out in hives. And, and so there had to be a way moving forward that I could channel that nervous energy. And what I tell young people um, today is that nerve, the, like this, it's, it's two sides of the same coin. Nervous is the other side of excitement, right? And so there is really no reason to be nervous if you have done your homework. If you know what it is that you're supposed to do when you get on that stage, your nerves can just be excited. You're just excited to get out there and to do it and just have fun and all of that. And you channel that energy so that it works for you as opposed to against you. So when you're, you know, I would get nervous and my mouth would go dry and, you know, and once my mouth goes dry, now I'm in my head, I'm panicking. But when I'm excited, I know that I have done my homework. You have to prepare ad nauseum. You do it again, 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 again. And one of the things I will do when I'm trying to master something, a part of a song, let's say, or there's a high note that I have to get to and how am I going to approach that? When I'm going through it and I have a plan, and I'm singing through it, and I get there, and it's, 
I, it's not happening. I will go back to the beginning and start again. And because it's about the continuity of it. It can't just be about the note. It has to be how I get there, how I land, and what happens afterwards. And that has to be not just technically, it has to be the emotion of it, what story am I telling, it's all of that. It is a lot of hard work. There are many layers to performance. And my advice to you it would be to do your homework and when you think you've got it, do it again. And then do it again. And then do it again. And do it again and again and again and again. And then when you get on stage and the nerves come, trust yourself. Just say to yourself, I know it, I know it, I know it. Trust and then fly. Yeah. Great. Um, okay, Michelle uh, has another question. Hey! Uh, yeah, <laughs> Michelle, so she asks, um, how long exactly have you been singing in musical theater? I know you talked about like, you started classical, but when was like that point where you switched full-time uh, to musical theater? Uh, first, I went from classical to uh, jazz in college. And then after college, um, I was sort of singing kind of pop, you know, kind of like jukeboxy kind of things. And so musical theater happened for me when I uh, did my first production of Dreamgirls. Uh, a national tour. Um, so, you know, I was, I was a young girl. I was probably 18 or 19 years old, but no, I was more like 20, 21, because I had left college already. So yeah, like maybe 21, 22 years old um, is when I, when I really got interested in musical theater. And it's so funny because so many of my friends, um, you know, they went to school for musical theater. That's what they studied. And, and that was not what I studied. I studied voice uh, classically and then jazz. And then I happened to get bit by the musical theater bug. <laughs> so I think maybe age 21 or 22, around there. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, great. So we have a couple more serious questions if you're up for that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Let's make sure. Um, so Adrian asks, uh, well, first she says, your voice is so beautiful. I really enjoyed listening to you sing. Thank what you. were you working on or would you be performing if COVID hadn't happened? Ah, okay. So I have been... I mentioned that I've been singing with symphony orchestras um, since uh, Newsies closed on Broadway. Um, and I've been doing quite a few programs of music with them. Um, so one of them is I was singing the music of Ella Fitzgerald. Um, and Ella celebrated her centennial a few years ago. So I was, you know, she was in big demand for concerts, so I did that. And then I do a Frank and Ella show that celebrates the music of Ella Fitzgerald and Frank Sinatra that I do with, um, with the singer Tony Desaire. Uh, but most recently, so just before COVID hit, we had done, Tony and I had done Frank and Ella in Maui with the Maui Pops Orchestra. Um, beautiful Maui paradise. Uh, and I flew home from that. I think it was March 9th. And then um, March 12th, we were, everything was canceled. And that weekend of March 12th, I would have been out singing the music of Aretha Franklin, doing a tribute to Aretha with symphony orchestras um, around this country with me and a, another singer, Ryan Shaw, who is one of the best soul singers you'll ever hear in your life. You can Google him, Ryan Shaw. <laughs> um, and so that's mostly what I would have been been working on and we had concerts scheduled for every weekend so um yeah so this quarantine has just kind of stopped me dead in my tracks i haven't been home this long for years 
<laughs> years and years and years. So yeah, the musical Rita. Great. Oh, and there's actually, a, she has a follow-up question about that. Okay. Uh, if that Aretha tribute gets rescheduled, oh, she says she would love to hear you sing it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I love the music of Aretha. I grew up uh, listening and, and singing, you know, all of her music. I just love it. And you say her name and people love her. And so, yeah, we have already uh, gotten some um, uh, notices from orchestras that they are gonna reschedule whenever we can get back, back in there. So, yes, so thank you, thank you. Uh, on, on a related topic, um, someone asks, so, so a, a lot of shows are getting canceled. How are you staying creatively fulfilled during quarantine? Which I think is a super important question. Well, it's really, it's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, but I, uh, I also serve on two boards. Um, I serve on the board of directors for Covenant House International, which is a, um, a shelter for homeless youth. And we have sites around the country and in North America and Central America. Um, and I also serve on the, the board of directors for the New York Pops. And so, you know, particularly with Covenant House, you know, when, when the pandemic hit, it hit right in the spring around the time when we would be planning our annual galas, which is where we raise all of our money or most of our money for, for the year. And so we pivoted from a in-person concert at Jazz at Lincoln Center to a virtual uh, concert. Um, and that was really, that was like six weeks of, you know, put your nose to the grind and try to get this done. And it really was a successful um, virtual gala that was, you know, uh, streamed live in, uh, uh, on uh, Amazon Prime and, and many different platforms. And so that was really good. And I sang for that. Um, and I've done a couple of virtual things for the New York Pops. And then also just for other orchestras that are trying to keep their subscribers plugged in during this time. They're doing different, um, you know, different things where like Tony and I did like a Frank and Ella afternoon with the Toronto Symphony virtually, where we sang a little bit and we did some questions with their patrons. And so, yeah, there's lots of stuff going on. Um, and this is one way to, this is one of my favorite things to do is to, um, talk to young people and to, to answer questions and to hopefully inspire someone. Um, it feeds my soul in the same way performing does, believe it or not. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's kind of what I've been doing. And, and every now and then, you know, if I have a song on my heart or I feel like I want to sing something, sometimes I may post a little piece of me singing something and people will say it inspired them or it encouraged them in a, in a down moment or something like that. So, yeah, yeah. Great. Um, Mariah, you remember one of our instructors, um, has another question. Okay. Um, again, it's more of a serious nature. So uh, she says, what do you hope to see in terms of Black res representation on Broadway and beyond? Wow. Well, um, I have many hopes <laughs> where that's concerned. Um, and, you know, I am... In the last few weeks, I am one of the founding members of a new organization called Black Theater United, uh, where we have come together, those of us in the theater, just to start to talk about these things and figure out how we move the needle forward. Um, because systemic racism is, is something that runs through the entire country. And when it runs through the country, Obviously, it's in Broadway, it's in theater, it's in all of that. So um, I think that, you know, a lot of people talk about diversity, but for us in our discussions around it, we've been talking about equity, right? 
really needing to see equity, um, not just on stage, you know, not just being able to, to you know, have our stories told and be the lead, uh, but also, you know, behind the scenes, right? So the people who, stage managers, uh, choreographers, directors, casting people, uh, producers, all of that, just having equity, having space at the table to, to make decisions and not just be a diversity hire, but be someone, a person, um, a Black person at the table who has a voice and who is supported in their voice and, and, and our experiences and all of that. So, yeah, and I can go on and on about my hopes, but that, but that is that's that's the starting point right to have equity across the board and then um and then to break down some of this systemic racism and 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 all of that so yeah yeah thank you it's a super important topic can you say again what your organization is black theater united thank and there's a website you can go you can see what we're all about <laughs> <laughs> and all that good stuff. It up. Yeah. Um, so we're winding down a little bit. If anyone else has any questions you would like to ask Capathia before we finish, I actually have one that I would love um, just because we are an arts organization and we have a lot of students and all of us as teachers are also performers. So what is the one piece of advice you would give to either a current performer starting out or an aspiring performer? Um, I mean, certainly what we've already talked about, um, you know, trusting your instincts and all of that, but I will also encourage you to really unpack for yourself why you want to do it. Because this is a, you know, when I talk to young people, I usually say to them something like this to illustrate what I'm, my point. Let's say by the time you've seen me, you know, in Newsies, let's say, you know, with my big pink feathers and my gorgeous costume. Uh, let's say by, by that time, I had auditioned for 11 different things. And 10 times they told me no. And the 11th time I get newsies. What you have to decide is what you do with those 10 times that they told you no. Because in this business, we get told no much more than we get told yes. So I would encourage you to figure that out. For me, sometimes it was a good cry when I didn't get it. It would just be a good cry. Sometimes it would be going out with my girlfriends. None of us got it. And so we're, we're out having coffee and we're commiserating about the director. He didn't know what he wanted anyway or whatever. <laughs> whatever. So it was always something, right? But I can guarantee you that every time I woke up the next day, all I wanted to do was sing. All I wanted to do was be on stage. You have to want it like that. You have to want it so badly <laughs> that it's the only thing you can really think of doing. Because if there's anything else that you want to do or anything else that you have passion for, that is probably the thing you should do. Because this is a hard business. It is tough. It's really, really tough. And I don't say that to scare you. I just say it to you so that you, you are prepared. You are prepared for those times that you are told no and what you do with them. You know, sometimes it could be maybe you weren't as prepared in the room that you as you needed to be. So, you know, when you go on auditions and all of that, make sure that you are uber prepared so that when you do it, when you do your audition, you can walk out of that room and you can leave it there and you can trust that if they don't hire you, they weren't looking for what you have. 
That is all that means. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Sarah asks, do you have any advice for jumping over from theater to getting started in the film industry? Hi, Sarah. Oh, well, I, you know, obviously I'm not a film star. <laughs> But I will tell you that I, I have had some success in television and I have done a couple of films. And what I would say is one of the technical <laughs> things that I learned early on in, in auditioning is, you know, the way you're taught in theater where you're speaking to the back wall and, you know, sometimes singing to the back wall and all that. The camera is right here. It's right here. So all of your gestures, all of your facial expressions are so much smaller than we learn in theater. We also talk softer in film. <laughs> um, so those are technical things. Um, but I will say with the medium of film and television too, you know, it really is, a lot of it is an editing medium and so you don't necessarily have the the control over what is the finished product you know what i mean you, you don't really have that control and so that is something that you you have to get used to you know when you're shooting and the, the camera is on you when they turn around for your shot they may turn around 20 times and we don't know what take they're going to use and you know you're trying to be consistent and in the moment and trying not to manufacture something so it's a lot it's a hard medium um but those are things that i would encourage you you to to really think about as you as you uh make that transition and really you know, forgive yourself and give yourself some time to, to wrap your brain around what that medium is. Give yourself space to fail and give your, and forgive yourself and, and, um, and do all you can just to, to move yourself into that, 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 uh, that genre. Great. Campathia, thank you so much. Your talk was so inspiring. I hope that our attendees felt that way as well. You gave such great advice. Your singing was beautiful. We just oh, so you. appreciate you being here and donating your time to us in such a hard time. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. And uh, I have a little quick, do you have any parting words you wanna say to anybody and our attendees before I throw up a little slide to finish out? Sure, I will just say, first of all, thank you all for, for being here, for listening to me go on and on and on. <laughs> thank you. Um, and then on a serious note, I wish you um, only goodness as you move forward in whatever it is that you're going to do. I wish you only goodness. And I will say that those of you who are already doing it and those of you who are aspiring, um, we need you. The world is waiting for you because only you are you <laughs> with your unique self. So yeah, I just wish you goodness. And thank you so much for being here today. Great, thank you so much. Um, so this is, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is our very first uh, Wednesday webinar. Thank you for being our very first person, Kapathia. Um, we have, oh, I'm gonna pull up the slide, sorry. I'm trying to talk while I'm doing it. Um, so we have a bunch of other great webinars coming up. It's every Wednesday from four to five. Next week is our very own Lily Markey, um, who's gonna do an acting workshop with everybody. She's one of our drama teachers at Wharton. Um, Every Wednesday from four to five, the following week, which I believe is the 15th, um, is Marissa McGowan and Michael Mendez, who are fabulous too. If anyone has any questions, you can feel free to contact me. Um, if you would like to support Wharton, you can text us to donate at 74121. 
all money that comes in from these Wednesday webinars is going directly to our scholarship fund to support Ooh. students that need help. So if you feel inclined, we would really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much. You can find more information about us at our website, wartonarts.org. Um, we have summer camps, music lessons, summer classes, and um, stuff during the year. Everything's virtual during the summer, so no matter where you are, you can participate. But um, that's all I have. Once again, Capathia, thank you so much for being here. It was wonderful. Um, we really appreciate it. And have an amazing 4th of July, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.